hi everyone! Today we're going over the very last chapter of Physics for the MCAT, which covers atomic and nuclear phenomena. Thank you again to Victoria for letting me use her slides for this. Chapter 9.1 is about the photoelectric effect, and it basically states that when light of high enough frequency strikes a metal, then the metal will emit an electron. And these electrons that are emitted may create a certain flow, which will cause a current. This light that hits the metal is called the incident light, or the incident photon, and this incident light must have a frequency that's higher than the threshold frequency in order for this emission to occur. This is known as an all-or-nothing event because as long as the incident light has a higher frequency than the threshold frequency, then emission will occur, and you won't get more emission if you increase the frequency further. And if you decrease the frequency below the threshold frequency, you won't get a little bit of emission or weak emission, you would just get no emission. Light is made of indivisible particles called photons, and what's important about these photons is first that they're quantized, which means that they're made of indivisible energy levels, and also that the energy of which is proportional to the frequency of light. The energy of a photon or of a beam of light is equal to E, which is energy, equals H, which is Planck's constant, multiplied by frequency. Planck's constant is one of the important constants that you should have memorized. So Planck's constant is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds. So when we multiply this by frequency, which is in units of 1 over seconds, the seconds conveniently cancels out. So we can get a unit of joules, which is the joules of energy. Another important equation in this section is C, which is the speed of light, which is equal to frequency multiplied by wavelength. So oftentimes you'll be asked to calculate for the wavelength of a certain light, but you only know the frequency, and that's how you would calculate that. The speed of light is also a really important constant to have memorized. It is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So it's convenient that frequency is in units of 1 over seconds and wavelength is in units of meters. I often stress the units of certain things because oftentimes if you forget the exact equation, you can pretty much guess your way there if you know the units of everything. And units are also a good way to double check that your equations are correct, as long as the units work out. We talked about how this emission is an all or nothing process, so whether you have an incident photon that is at the threshold frequency or it is far, far above the threshold frequency, you will still only have one electron emitted per photon and the excess energy will be converted into kinetic energy. This kinetic energy is denoted by K max, which is equal to HF, which is the energy of your incident photon, minus the work function. The work function is simply how much energy is required to eject the electron, which is equal to H, which is Planck's constant, multiplied by the threshold frequency. I like to think about these two equations as one equation, where the excess energy you'll get is equal to the amount of energy you put in, minus the amount of energy that was required for the electron to be ejected. Chapter 9.2 covers the absorption and emission of light. I think that this very analog image covers most of what you'll need to know in this section. It shows that when light is absorbed by an atom, this corresponds to an increase in the energy of a particular electron, which sends it from a lower orbit to a higher orbit. And when a photon is emitted, this corresponds to the opposite change, where an electron falls from a higher orbit to a lower orbit, causing a photon to be emitted. Since the energy difference between each of these orbits is very precisely defined, this is also an example of energy that is quantized. So you'll need precisely an energy equivalent to HF, where E is the energy that's required to either um, raise an electron to a higher orbit or lower an electron to a lower orbit equals h, which is Planck's constant, multiplied by f, which is the frequency of light required to do so. These ideas are very important in spectroscopy, particularly in infrared spectroscopy and in UV-vis spectroscopy, because the energy levels of each molecule are distinct, and so um, getting a spectrum of when light is absorbed in a molecule is useful in determining what the molecule is. These ideas are covered more in organic chemistry and in general chemistry. They're not as important in the physics book. These ideas are also relevant to fluorescence, which is when instead of the electron going all the way down to the ground state at once, it will take multiple steps. So a photon of lower energy will be emitted. So if you excite an electron with very high energy UV radiation, sometimes you will get visible light back instead. The actual details of this are a subject of quantum mechanics and it's not very relevant to the MCAT. 
This entire section is very low yield. You're better off reviewing chapter one of general chemistry and the equations surrounding the Bohr model. Chapter 9.2 is about nuclear binding and the mass defect. The mass defect is a phenomenon where the actual mass of a nucleus is actually slightly less than the sum of all the protons and neutrons. And this excludes hydrogen because hydrogen only has one proton. And this is because in the process of binding, some of the matter has been converted to energy. So if you're ever asked why there is a defect, this is why. In order to calculate the nuclear binding energy, you'll use the equation E equals mc squared, where m is the amount of mass that's missing, c is the speed of light, and E is the amount of nuclear binding energy. Chapter 9.4 covers nuclear reactions, and this is probably the most high yield section in this entire chapter. There are two kinds of nuclear reactions. The first is fusion, which is when two or more smaller nuclei come together to form a larger nucleus. This is what largely drives the sun because hydrogen will come together to become helium. The other type is called fission, and fission is when a larger nucleus splits into smaller nuclei, and this is the kind of nuclear reaction used in nuclear power plants. Fission often causes a chain reaction that causes nearby atoms to undergo fission as well. Nuclear reactions are written in something called isotopic notation, where this large X here will be where you'll write your atomic symbol, where the Z is where you'll write the number of protons, and A is where you'll write the mass number. This notation is kind of redundant because the number of protons necessarily defines what element it is. This is a chart of all the kinds of radioactive decay, and it's important to know everything on this chart because you'll often be asked on the MCAT if this particular kind of decay happens, then what will your products be? So in alpha decay, you have your original particle with a mass number A and with an atomic number Z. And in alpha decay, this will release what is called an alpha particle, which is basically just a helium atom. A helium atom has a mass of four because it has two protons and two neutrons, and it has an atomic number of two because it has two protons. So your resulting other particle from this will be denoted by Y, and this Y is basically just your original element, but with four less mass units and with an atomic number that is two less than the original. So that's represented in this chart where your atomic number will go down by two and your mass number will go down by four. Beta negative decay is when you have your original particle and this particle emits an electron. However, it doesn't emit an electron from its orbitals of electrons. It emits an electron by taking a neutron and converting it to a proton. So like we know, a neutron is neutral and a proton has a positive charge. So by removing an electron from your neutron, you basically get an additional proton, which raises your atomic number by one, but leaves your mass number the same. Beta positive decay is kind of similar to this, where you have your original particle and you emit what's called a positron. And because you have emitted this positron, you basically turn a proton into a neutron because a proton has a positive charge and a neutron has a neutral charge. So by emitting this positive charge, you have decreased the atomic number by one. And the mass number, of course, stays the same. Gamma decay is when only energy is emitted, and so neither the atomic number nor the mass number will change. The only thing that will change is that a gamma particle, which has no mass and no charge, will be emitted. This gamma particle is often a photon, or I think it is a photon, um, so all that will happen is that your atom will have less energy. Electron capture is when electrons are captured from the outside world. And so because of this electron capture, you'll turn a proton into a neutron, um, turning the positive charge into a neutral charge. And so you'll have a atomic number decrease by one, but your mass number will remain the same. Another concept you'll be tested on often is that of half-life, where the half-life is the amount of time it takes for half of the sample to decay. And it's important to note that this half-life is always constant for a particular material. So as you can see, this graph is plotting the percentage of um, nuclei remaining against the number of half-lives. So after one half-life, you'll go from 100% to 50%. And then after another half-life, you'll go from 50% to 25%. So this forms an exponential decay um, curve, which means that the rate at which the radioactive decay happens is proportional to the number of nuclei that remain. 
So what this means is that if you have less nuclei that remain, then you'll have less decay, even though the half-life is the same. This is governed by this equation here, which is n, which is the number of um, nuclei that remain undecayed, is equal to n naught, which is the number that you originally had, multiplied by e, which is the natural number e, to the power of negative lambda, which is the decay constant, multiplied by t, which is time. I have never used this equation before and I don't really recommend remembering it because you'll rarely ever be given the decay constant or be asked to calculate the decay constant. What you'll be asked to do is you'll be given the half-life and you'll be asked to calculate how long it takes for a sample to decay to a certain amount or you'll be given the end amount and you'll be asked how many half-lives it took to get there from the original amount. So the method that I always use is that I just write the number of half-lives and then I write the amount that would remain after the particular half-life. And so after one half-life, you'll have half the sample. After two half-lives, you'll have a fourth. After three half-lives, you'll have an eighth and so on. And so if you're asked that you have a sample that starts off with 200 grams, how many half-lives would it take to get to 25 grams? I would write this out and then I would write after one half-life, I would have 100 grams. After two half-lives, I would have 50 grams. And then after three half-lives, I'll have 25 grams. So I'll know that the answer is three half-lives. And you can also do this for when you're given the amount of half-lives and you're asked to calculate how much of it remains. So this concludes the physics for the MCAT series. Thank you so much for watching and I hope this series helped you out. This series has been really fun for me to make and yeah, 